Hey. There's still time to leave, you know. So, um, Brendan here has been working in the demo art scene and coding for about 30 years. Uh, I've been seeing snippets of uh, demo scene stuff at other hacker conferences like the, uh, the old Nauticon in Ohio and other things. And some of that stuff has been really mind-blowing. And I've always wanted to have something like this at Hope. And I finally met the right guy a couple months ago at the Vintage Computer Festival in Wall, New Jersey, which I highly recommend. And by the way, the VCF people are downstairs with a vintage computer exhibit. Um, but anyway, this is, as the description of the panel is, or the talk is, it's, it's software piracy that became an underground art scene. It's like the most pure hacker thing I can imagine. So check out how we ended up from the mid-80s software piracy, just the most in incredibly small code, graphic, audio, mind-blowing stuff with a great screening of what, two hours of this stuff afterwards, as long as you want to stay. Yeah, so much. it's inverse phase. This is awesome. Uh, first, I want to just thank everyone for coming out. Can we bring the house lights down? I can't see anyone. And they're not going to be able to see this as well. Cool. Awesome. Now I won't be blind. Sweet. Uh, so uh, this is a scene that's really important to me, and I feel like it fits in really well at Hope. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure uh, there are a pile of hackers and crackers in the room, just maybe. Um, so I really, I, uh, this, this is just near and dear. This is my scene, and I finally get to share it with Hope. I've been to Hope tons of times. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Bernie for roping me into this. And uh, all the Hope crew for like working with me and getting this in because that was awesome. And uh, everyone for showing up because finally I get to share something that is very personal with you. Promise, not that personal, but I just want to get that out. Um, it's all downhill from here, so I, I, want, <laughs> I really wanted to get that out now. Um, I'm going to introduce you to something called the demo scene. Um, can I get a show of hands of people that already know what the demo scene is? <laughs> Fuck yes. That is so good. Okay. Um, can I get a show of hands from the people that know what the demo scene is that know where the demo scene came from originally? Okay, so maybe about a half to a third of the hands. Uh, still a good number, uh, but the first part of this presentation or talk or whatever the hell you want to call it is going to be me talking about history. Some of this is going to be a little bit boring. Some of you are going to know this. I'm not going to get everything right. Uh, you know, this is well rehearsed and I live this, so most of it should be right. But if I slip, please forgive me. Um, but uh, most importantly, uh, I realized, and I've kind of realized as walking around Hope, really while I'm here, I'm like among my people, right? You, you all are like my people, and I can just talk to you about this. But I've spoken to several people over the weekend that are old enough to drink with me, and I have enjoyed those drinks very much. Uh, but I have also noticed that those people that are old enough to drink with me don't know what a modem is, or just haven't used one. Um, and uh, and there, so, so there are some gaps we need to fill in here. So um, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to that. And also, before I start the slides, um, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and uh, why I'm sitting here. So, uh, like Bernie said, I've been writing chip tunes for about 30 plus years, which makes me an old man. Sorry, uh, but uh, this incredible like demo scene thing is actually kind of what kicked off my music career. Uh, I've been involved with Magfest in the past. Um, actually, if you were at Hope like 16 years ago or something like that. Do you remember the Dance Dance clone written in Python in the corner? Do I? <laughs> that, that was my baby. Um, so, you know, there, there are some things that I have done in the past. Uh, not all of them great, but uh, some of them kind of cool. My most recent claim to fame is uh, a Nine Inch Nails album redone you know, on eight different 8-bits and that sort of a thing. I've kind of gone down this pilgrimage. Um, I feel sort of like I've, uh, you ever, I mean, uh, Star Wars is a good example where, you know, like the, the student, the young Padawan goes to, you know, the, uh, 
the the remote desert, right? And uh, you know, studies forever, disappears off the face of the planet, uh, and you know, like learns all of these things, and then like goes back and shares with their friends or you know their their colleagues or whatever. So this is the sharing with the friends part. But I've been on a long journey where I've been learning about like. 10, 20 different kinds of sound chips, how to control them. I'm building a synthesizer from scratch. Uh, I am, if, uh, who in here knows what a tracker is, like mod files and stuff? <laughs> Hell yeah. So mods are how I got my start with music and I'm writing a tracker from scratch that will control hardware chiptune stuff. Uh, and the board we also built from scratch and like it's gonna be modular, it's gonna be really awesome. So uh, if you wanted, I don't have a slide for this, that's why I'm just yammering. Um, if you want to follow me on uh, like anything, I am Inverse Phase. I have a Patreon. Uh, it's just Inverse Phase, all one word, on pretty much everything, or inversephase.com links you to all my stuff. So if you want to see some of the cool stuff, or just ask me later, or something like that. Um, so let's talk about the demo scene. Uh, before I get started on demo scene stuff, I want to know, you to know that you might see some bad words. And that's what this slide is about. Also, if you are offended by the notion of boobies, uh, you know, <laughs> it doesn't seem like anyone is, but uh, you should be notified that, you know, this is a thing that's going to happen if you are uh, not old enough to be looking at boobies. Well, anyway, uh, let's move on. This slide has changed very slightly. If there is anyone in the room with epilepsy, and this is actually kind of a serious notice, uh, there are a lot of flashing colors, flashing lights, uh, shit moving around on the screen. Um, you know, if uh, you have been previously offended, or maybe your brain has been offended, but you liked it, uh, with flashing lights or like rave dance effects on the wall, or MTV Party to Go from the 90s, um, then maybe this is not for you, or please make sure that you're medicated. Uh, something like that. All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, this is my cool slide where I... <laughs> the demo scene, what are this? Uh, so I, I, I really, this is, this is just a, a glimpse into this, right? Maybe you've seen this picture. Does anyone recognize this picture? I have two, three hands, four, okay. That's great already, uh, but you're going to recognize this after we're over. Not just because you saw the screenshot, but uh, you know, the, I, w I want you to see some pretty pictures. These are all procedurally generated. Um, well, not all of them. You're going to see one that isn't, uh, but these three are, and uh, these are just like this is math making art. It's <laughs> it is fucking magic. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and here's one more. This is not procedurally generated. This is, uh, you know, in the scene art category, if you want to call it that. Um, but uh, Bernie and I had several, uh, several conversations about how scheduling was like a Rubik's Cube. So here's your Rubik's Cube. Uh, you know, you'll see another one later on if you're sticking around. Um, so, you know, what have I told you? By the way, I'm really working the memes hard here. So um, I hope you appreciate them. Uh, that these demos <laughs> fit on that tiny little piece of paper. Uh, well, they don't really fit on that piece of paper, but, uh, well, I will, maybe. Um, the important thing to realize is that these screenshots of these demos right here are larger than the program that generated them. Um, and this is just like the beginning, who, who here just like kind of ooh, ah, or their brain like kind of tingled or whatever. Like, yeah, okay. So we impressed like four people, that's great. Um, all right, so let's rewind actually, and I'm gonna tell you why this is impressive, not just because of that, but there are some more things. Also, I'm using some old school memes here, like be kind, rewind. Uh, so it's time for a history lesson. Uh, this is a computer, sort of. You may have heard of one uh, earlier in Hope because there was history of the ENIAC, right? Did we, uh, yeah, some shout outs to anyone that knows what an ENIAC or ENIAC is. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about, actually that picture sucks here, this one. Um, let's talk about the exchange of ideas. Let's talk about why we're here and let's talk about art and let's talk about trying to be creative with one another and communicate with each other. Um, how did we do that? 
<laughs> However in the fuck did we do that? Um, so if you wanted to get an idea to someone, uh, how, how would you get an idea to someone today? Go ahead, tell me. Why is the room quiet? Is it because we're all introverts and we don't talk to each other? Screw you, learn to text each other, fuck you. <laughs> um, we would probably do it over the internet, but this is what the internet looked like in 1969. Uh, not very cool, to be honest. Uh, and even if you fast forward a little bit, uh, you know, oh, this is how we got on the internet. Not, not just, you know, like to pick up the handset and talk to cute girls like this one, but, uh, you know, you, you wanted to reach out and touch someone, you'd pick up the goddamn phone. Um, and I'm being a little bit irritable here because I do wish people would talk to each other more. So let's, let's go forward to 1977. Internet looks a little bit cooler now. Um, I, I do like how right here, you know, we just have something called Utah. Um, you know, and you got a couple of other places, uh, you know, Texas. Texas is just one place, let me tell you. You know, uh, but we do have some other cool stuff going on over here. Apparently Stanford and USC are like pretty far apart from each other. And, uh, and Xerox is all the fuck over here, but, you know, like, and uh, over here we've got, you know, Rutgers and Carnegie Mellon. You know, Illinois is just one place again, you know, of course. Uh, apparently the NSA was on the internet in 1977, that's good. Um, but, you know, what all of these are is either, uh, they're, they're all government entities. So, even in the 70s, you know, like, ARPANET exists and, you know, we were dividing up the internet and that sort of a thing and figuring out how the fuck we were going to use this thing. But, uh, even more importantly, uh, we, were, we were doing something awesome, which was trying to get computers to talk to each other. Uh, guess what? I wasn't alive then. Uh, but I was born shortly thereafter, and uh, I used some stuff like this. So, what if you had uh, one of these, you know, or maybe one of these? First of all, show of hands, who had a Commodore 64 as a kid in its heyday? Awesome. Still do. Great. If you want to get rid of it, let me know. Um, for the people that do want to get rid of it, let me know. Uh, who had one of these guys who had an Atari 8-bit? Okay, so we got like five people, that's all right. The Commodore people don't hate you anymore, we just make fun of you and good fun and then we give you hugs and drink with you. Um, so say you had one of these and one of these, and by the way, does anyone not know what this is over here? Does anyone not know how to use one? This, this specific model, I do have a hand or two. You, you stick your finger in it and you rotate it around and I'm just gonna keep going. So, uh, so you pick up that handset and you drop it in one of these guys. And so anyone, uh, anyone save up their allowance or whatever, you know, maybe there are some people old enough that they saved up, you know, money from work uh, to get one of these. These are acoustic couplers. Uh, so, uh, in the heyday, actually, shout outs to, I don't, I don't know if he's here, uh, the dude that gave the telco history panel today. Uh, that was really cool. Yeah, Keith. So, um, oh, T, right. So, point is, T Profit was, uh, you know, like talking about what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do with the early phone system. And one of the things you weren't allowed to do with the early phone system was connect external things to the phone system. So to get your computer to talk to another computer, you wouldn't actually take that phone line and plug it into your computer because it wasn't allowed. So you'd just take a phone, which was issued to you by the phone company and possibly even hardwired into the wall, and just take the handset and drop it on an acoustic coupler and you'd be able to use it. Um, the other bonus of the acoustic coupler is, say you're traveling or on business or whatever, and you're in a hotel room, there's a phone there, you can, you know, very easily, without having to do any sort of interconnecting thing, do this. You have these little suction cups that don't really work very well to, you know, get some data across. Eventually, we grew up a little bit, and uh, we wanted one of these. Um, so here's a nice little, you know, ISA card. Uh, or you could get an external modem, you could plug that into your computer, and then you could plug the phone line straight into it. Now, the era was over where the phone company was trying to restrict you with what you would do with your phone and your computer and your own hardware at your house. This was nice. Um, so, finally, 
we have, you know, these things that we can plug into our computers and, you know, like, oops, sorry about that. We can, you know, go and do things. So um, how, when we have a computer and we have one of these, are we going to exchange ideas with each other? Thank you. That makes me feel so good. You have no idea. I'm not going to show you. Um, so uh, we didn't have the internet yet still. I mean, we did, but it looked like that government institution map where Illinois is just a single thing. Um, so meanwhile, in Chicago, uh, there's this Christensen guy. And he was like, hey, I have an idea. Now that I have this modem and I have a phone line, and I can plug my computer into the phone line. I'm just going to plug my computer in the phone line and write some software so that my computer just answers the phone when anyone calls it. And everyone's like, well, what's, what the hell is going to happen then? <laughs> and the answer is, well, you know, or you get CBBS, which could be Ward Christensen's BBS or Chicago BBS or, uh, you know, several other things uh, kind of convenient that it has all of these connotations that make it easy to remember. And uh, so you'd get something that looks like this, you know, and you'd be able to log in. You could type your name, that sort of a thing. Um, and you could be online. Uh, there would be no graphics. You would not hear you've got mail. Uh, you would also not have anything like Internet Explorer, which I'm sure everyone in this room uses. Um, so, you know, here's, here's an example. Wildcat! Yeah. Who was it that I talked to yesterday that asked me about Wildcat? Are you in here? No, I guess not. But uh, anyway, uh, you get menus. And really, this is a little internet in a box. Uh, this is super important. Like, you have, you know, a message menu. You have a file menu. You have bulletins. You can post, like, announcements, files, place you can download stuff, messages, like a forums. You can, uh, you can go over here. You can live chat if the, if the computer happens to have more than one phone line hooked up to it. Yeah, doors menu. You can go over here and play some games. Lord and Trade Wars are the shout outs. All right, if we're going to talk about door games, did anyone in here play VGA Planets? Okay, we got a couple of woos. How about, uh, how about Wasteland? Okay, all right. Everyone likes Trade Wars, though. All right, fine. Um, so you could do all of these like cool things. It's just an internet in the box. Notice you have some time left. You have 55 minutes left, and then you get booted off. And then the next day, your time refills. Um, so, basically, if this board only has one phone line, that gives everyone else a chance to participate. Uh, you could pay for more privileges or that sort of a thing. Uh, you know, you could drop the privileges if you, you know, like hated a user or something. I don't know. Um, that's, but there were also these other things. You notice this, like, kind of, oops, sorry. That, you know, you've got some sort of, like, graphical sort of looking things, but it's obviously text mode. And then everyone got creative. And they're like, hey, we want to trade our creative art. Uh, so this, this is a, a, another Wildcat board. You can see this one is internet enabled. So you can actually get on BBSs and kind of experience this world, even though it's dead, uh, by telnetting into something or SSHing into something. Um, and so here are some addresses. Someone can try them if they have like you know, a telnet client on their phone or laptop or whatever. Um, so you. You get the board, and it asks you your first and your last name, and it sees if you've logged into the board before. If you haven't, well, you know, it asks you if you want to create an account, and if you have, then great. But I wanted to show you how cool some of the art from just the login screen scene was. This is all like ASCII and ANSI art, so this will all appear on a computer that's just stuck in text mode. You could have the shittiest computer in the world and still look at something that looks like it resembles most of this. Um, and so, you know, we've got some shout outs. We've got Genesis and Plus32. Is that Spain? Maybe it's Portugal. Uh, we have On Earth as it was in Hell. Uh, 703, shout outs to Northern Virginia. Uh, the Sysop is apparently Satan. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, this one, you know, uh, no, no spoilers here. This, was, this is in Chicago, area code 312. And down here we have a Plus49 number, so that's Germany, right? Um, Skylight BBS, but like this kind of art scene erupted out of just people wanting to trade, you know, software and messages and ideas on these online services. 
And it's kind of interesting how everyone traded anything. And so, oh, does anyone like Scooby-Doo? Yeah. Or here's, here's your Trade Wars shout out. You could play games. Like these are only text mode games, but they're multiplayer games. You play your rounds when you log in. You log out, someone else logs in, someone plays their rounds. You know, you, uh, you basically have this kind of turn-based game throughout the day. And you could log in for only five minutes and then log out and then go back to the door later and log in and log out. So you could get multiple rounds that way if the door game allowed it. Who was, uh, who was our Lord shoutouts? Yeah. You want some memories? Here's some memories. Uh, Seth Abel wrote this. Also wrote a, uh, um, what was it, Baron Realms Elite? Was that, was that Seth's? Yeah, so uh, he did a, a, a space planets type thing. Uh, so that was cool. And, uh, and here's some more art, just because it's like, I mean, look at this art. This art is cool. We've got a pretty awesome looking Stimpy. We've got some cool skull art. This chick is pretty cute. I'd like to know who she is. Um, this one too, even though she's a robot, but yeah. Um, but these are all like, you can see, like there's, it's a login screen. Like you can actually like log in. It kind of, the, the, the weird thing is, is like, you know, we watch uh, like hack, shout outs to hackers, right? Like we watch hackers and we're like, none of that shit is real. But like we all, almost have, like this is probably what inspired like the weird login screens in hackers is, you know, like ANSI login screens on BBSs and stuff like that. So it's really neat. Um, so I want to show you just a little bit more BBS stuff and then we're going to back up and talk about how this relates to piracy. Actually, this slide sort of relates to piracy. Hey, it's the file section. Guess what piracy is? Downloading stuff. Um, so we've got, you know, uh, this is just an example of, you know, like you, you log in, you go to the file section with F or D or whatever, and you go to sections and you look for files. And of course, remember, you're on like a 14.4 or 9600 baud modem, so you're going to get, you know, like 1K a second downloads at most. Um, if you're on a 300 baud modem, you're getting 30 characters per second. That's pretty hot. Um, so, uh, you know, here's some ARJ files. Anyone know what ARJ actually is? We've got like three people. Great. Um, ARJ is another zipper. Um, so you can see the fi these file sizes. You can see how many people have downloaded the file to see if it's maybe popular. You know, if you're one of those bandwagoner people. Um, also, you have this neat thing down here, tag file. So you could just like hit one and download file one on a lot of BBSs, or you could be like tag file one and then go over to another filed section or whatever and look at some more stuff and then tag stuff and download all of the things that you put in your queue at the same time to kind of like save some time since you're limited. Uh, so that's kind of neat. And here's another, uh, another good example. So here we see, we even see the ANSI and ASCII art invading the description. You're on T-Mobile. Um, you can download art packs of the ANSI art with the description as more ANSI art. It's like ASCIIception or something like that. But, um, you know, yeah. And that's, that's where these, uh, you know, like BBS sysops, uh, you know, would download utilities so that uh, you could add all of these files automatically to like your BBS files section. You'd run a little scan thing and it would look for the file ID dis file and put it in the description automatically for you so you didn't have to like, you know, cut and paste because who does that shit in DOS. Um, so, uh, you know, this is actually another comms package that is graphical. Um, but you can see that you can click on a file and tag it or just click on a file and download it or whatever you want to do or press space. You can use the arrow keys, that sort of a thing. So that's kind of neat. Uh, you know, uh, kind of forward thinking considering you could do this in like, you know, late 80s, early 90s. No AOL, I mean, AOL existed, but you weren't on AOL. You were calling a computer that was potentially even down the street from you. Um, so once you actually get to download things, anyone know what game this is? Excellent. I am around, I, I totally am among my people. This is great. Um, so, you know, downloading Rise of the Triad, we're only seven minutes in. We've got, you know, 30 minutes left to download this three and a half meg file. Um, also, does anyone recognize the, uh, the terminal software we're using? 
Nope. Nothing term. What? Nope. Anyone remember Telex? All right. So one of the reasons that I'm going through all this BBS stuff is because this is how I discovered this scene. Uh, you know, of course, I copied a couple games just like everyone else. But what I discovered is that when I downloaded, I, I fell into the computer museum or computer museum, computer music scene really hard at the end of the 80s. Um, and I downloaded some music. And these are some soundtrack or mod files. So here's Mega Mix 88. And you can see there are instruments in the file. This is a player that, you know, just shows you the instruments that are in this file because they're a form of music that kind of resembles MIDI, but I would hate to call it MIDI because that offends people in this scene. Um, also, because it's not MIDI at all. It's kind of a wavetable thing with an Excel spreadsheet attached to it. And when you're writing these, you can click a play button and it steps through the spreadsheet and that sort of a thing. Uh, but it stores a recording of every single one of those instruments. Um, so you have fun bass and Shamus, you know, which is not a whale. Uh, or maybe that's Shamu, but anyway, uh, heavy snare, heavy bass. But sometimes people would replace the names of their instruments with, yo, I'm Jester of Sanity. And by the way, uh, all these samples are mine except for sample 10, which sample 10 is only 2K, so like a snare drum or something, I don't know. Um, and you go down and, whoa, Jester of Sanity's name is Volker Tripp and lives in Germany and is like giving you a phone number to call. This could be his number. This could be his address. What the hell? People were just like doxing themselves in their own music files. <laughs> like, and the answer is he wanted to get gigs. He wanted people that were interested in his music to get in touch with him. We were trying to connect with our scene. There is no such thing as doxing in like the 80s. I mean, there is, but like, you know, we were, we were just trying to connect with each other. We're like, hey, I'm out here. Uh, I have this computer. It seems to be able to call other computers. Maybe we can talk some time. <laughs> Does anyone else like Amiga? <laughs> you know, I mean, like, this is, this is where we're at in the 80s and the early 90s. You know, we're not trolling each other online. We're trying to figure out if anyone else even has the ability to get online. Um, you know, so this number, for all I know, is not Fulker's number. It might be a BBS where his music is available or it might just be his house phone. Um, so I actually had an experience. Uh, there was another mod composer named Sidewi uh, uh, Sidewinder. Anyone hear of him? So his real name is Eric Giesk. Um, and uh, inside of his mods, he always you know, like left little messages just like this. And uh, he used to live in San Antonio. And there was a phone number in one of his. And I just decided to pick up the phone and call it. I was like 11 or something. <laughs> And I had a 30-minute conversation with him about, like, his Amiga 3000 and, like, you know, uh, that he was, like, super into pizza and that he was trying to get a job for Sega and whatever. It wasn't a BBS. It was just his house phone. And so we just had a nice conversation. So uh, uh, maybe five years ago or whatever, um, I'm, I'm friends with him on Facebook now, right? And it's, like, weird. Um, and uh, I sent him a message, and I was like, hey, you remember that kid that, like, sent you a check from his, like, possibly not entirely legal checking account? Um, and, uh, you know, like, ordered your CD and, you know, asked if you could, like, maybe give him free shipping on the phone while you were talking about Amiga 3000s with, like, obviously a kid that hadn't gone into junior high. <laughs> And, uh, and he was like, oh, hey, how you doing? Uh, like, I told him that I'd, like, become a computer musician and whatever and invited him out to a show that I was playing near him. He lives in Boston now. And he was like, sure. And he came out to my show, and that was, like, really just neat. So, anyway. Um, so, we're all just nerds. We're nice people. We want to share. We want to share ideas. Uh, we want to share our games, maybe some of the stuff that looks like this. This is actually from the Library of Congress. Uh, they do have stuff like uh, in sync hotline fantasy phone CD-ROM game. <sighs> I, I know some people at the Library of Congress, so maybe I shouldn't comment on that. But um, the point
point is is that you know we're trying to at this point we're trying to archive the software but you know you used to actually get software in boxes like this I don't know if anyone knows this but you know like you actually used to go to a store and they would have software on the shelf um, and uh, and the stores look kind of like this and uh, So has anyone walked north on 7th Avenue about two blocks? There's like a little cafe or something like that called Egghead. And I like head turned and double took at it when I passed it. I was like, is that Egghead? Egghead, do you see my mouse cursor moving here, Egghead? Um, and uh, it turns out it's just like a tea bar or something, I don't know. Um, but uh, you used to go to Egghead or software, etc or Babbage's, or Electronics Boutique, or, you know, that thing formerly known as GameStop, now it's just known as I don't shop there. Uh, um, CompUSA, yeah, we got some shout outs for CompUSA. Did you ever go to, uh, well, if you're from here, you might know about uh, Software City, um, which was like a huge competitor to CompUSA, but uh, like, not, uh, well, they're all fucking dead now. <laughs> not big enough for Amazon. Uh, so, you know, we had all of these places. I chose these because these are the origin developers. Uh, they bought a copy of Ultima at a software store to prove they were legit. Uh, and, uh, you know, just some more boxed games because, I, I don't know, there's something attractive about a box. Is anyone, like, into LPs? I feel like, you know, collecting software and, like, big box software is kind of like collecting LPs. It's just that you're a computer nerd. So, um, sometimes you didn't... <laughs> uh, <laughs> fucking owned. <laughs> I was ready for you. <laughs> Sometimes you're poor and begging for quarters on the corner of the street like the people out front of the hotel because you want to go and buy a copy of Wolfenstein, obviously. Um, but sometimes you just can't quite peddle that money to get Wolfenstein and you need to ask a friend for a copy of Wolfenstein. Um, must be installed on hard drive. Uh, just type B colon install. So this person clearly had a five and a quarter and a three and a half drive. And, uh, you know, wanted you to make sure that, you know, I mean, if you had a three and a half drive and it was the A drive, you didn't adopt soon and uh, you like, you know, like you, you never had a five and a quarter drive. Your three and a half was A drive. Just saying. Uh, so every once in a while, your discs look like this. And uh, I want to show you some more. Sometimes they came in one of these. Here's the front of that, just in case you want to know what that looks like. Did anyone ever ship floppies in the U.S.? Don't worry, the government doesn't care anymore. I will be in two months. Really? Wait a minute, what are you going to ship? Uh, lots of badges for my for Oh, and they're going to be floppy disks? Why didn't I hear about this? <laughs> It, the, the spoiler is I used to be involved with MAGFest, which I guess I did mention, but, you know, like, I just... This is, this is how I learn about MAGFest things, obviously. So, um, so, I noticed that basically no hands went up here, and that's because in the U.S. we didn't really do this. Like, there was, like, Software of the Month Club, I guess, uh, and, like, shareware companies, and you could, like, call up a shareware company and be like, yo, I want the shareware versions of you know, like this, this, and the other thing. And, uh, you know, they'd send you a disk box and, you know, every once in a while you'd mail order software or something like that. But if we were trading software, uh, there's a variety of reasons. Some people were like completely petrified of the post office and the postal service and like being caught by the government, I guess. Uh, some people were not at all afraid of the government, but were afraid that, you know, like if the USPS ran that disk through like an x-ray or something, that'd be demagnetized or erased or that sort of a thing. Here's the thing, in Europe, People have some balls. <laughs> so, some stuff got sent in the mail. And as uh, with the other floppies, you, you know, get instructions right here on the desk on how to load. 
Shout out to my Commodore peeps. Um, you know, obviously everything's been copied over, you know, a billion times. I wonder what top 20 software pools were on here. Obviously, here's just like literally a directory listing that someone print screened off of the screen. <laughs> yeah, but Mind Shadow was actually kind of cool. Um, use the living tutorial for instructions. Okay, whatever. Um, so these games, by the way, when anyone copied any of these, what did you have to do to copy a floppy? Sometimes you had to do a little bit extra. Turn off the right protect. Turn, turn off the right protect? Poke a hole in it. Yeah, all right, good. <laughs> Poke a hole in it. Okay. But sometimes you couldn't copy a disk. <laughs> Who here has cracked a game? All right, we got some crackers. Good. Um, so... Every once in a while, these guys didn't want you to copy their game. They're a bunch of, like, honestly pretty genius ideas and maybe some not-so-genius ideas in, you know, software that was copy-protected. Uh, one of my favorites I was talking about, like, yesterday or whatever is uh, intentionally putting bad sectors on a disk. I think that was a cool idea. Despite that it was easy to defeat, uh, it was still a really neat idea. Um, so you basically tell, you, I mean, you're using like some sort of hardware copier or whatever. It's just copying literally the magnetics of the disk. And that's how the distributors would distribute the software. But whenever you copy, whenever you make a floppy disk, you're, you know, you're just writing the bits. You're writing ones and zeros to the disk. Um, so you couldn't do something like copy a bad sector on the disk because the bad sector would be written as an in-between value. And unless you had a magnetic copier, you know, that was, or an analog copier, if you want to call it that, or something like that, uh, you wouldn't be able to copy that bad sector. And smart copying packages would basically write, uh, you know, they, they would just continue. You know, they would, they would be like, well, I read it like 10 times, and I got one like seven of the times, so it's going to be a one, even though I don't know that it's a one. So when you load the game, the game would intentionally try to read from that bad sector, and there are a couple options. One, the sector could be bad, and the, the operating system would return an error, or the kernel, or the ROM, or, you know, the disk would return an error, and the game would be like, okay, there's an error. We can go on. But sometimes it would return a zero or a one, and the game would be like, eh, that disk isn't legit, and that's how that copy protection would work. So, basically, people, the geniuses that just rose their hand, had probably defeated this kind of copy protection, uh, the workaround is literally just to, like, say, instead of if there is an error, just change it to if there isn't an error. Uh, you know, it's it's not terribly hard to defeat, but it's a cool idea. Um, you know, and there are other things, yeah, I mean, they might have paired this with other ideas. You know, there are other things that you could have done. Um, but just, just to give you an idea of what we're up against, right? Uh, so once you have done this really cool feat, you've discovered this cool way to break this copy protection on your floppy disk, You'd leave your mark. Aquatron by Justin Gray, but it was cracked by the freeze. Thanks to the man in black, the penguin, and the bum. <laughs> so maybe that guy actually was able to afford Wolfenstein after all. Um, we also have, you know, uh, 1942, which was cracked by Rad War. And we have, you know, Kong Strikes Back, cracked by ABC. So people, and notice ABC also made it into the high score table over here. <laughs> so, so people would leave their mark. You know, uh, they wanted you to know that they were a badass and that they were able to figure out this, you know, like possibly single byte change. But still, you know, no one else would figure out this single byte change. So we, you know, these were the elite of the copy protection world. But sometimes you'd put in the disk and you'd type that load eight, you know, load star comma eight comma one, and we're about to get audio. Let's see if the volume is set right. Maniac Mansion here. And you're like, wait a minute, this isn't Maniac Mansion. This guy says it's Maniac Mansion. Broken. Wait a minute, my software's broken by Eaglesoft on July 23rd, 1987. Greetings. Okay, to Stingray, FPR, The Alliance. Who are these people? Weepa, Sin, TSI, The Master. It's 
1987, I have no idea what's going on. The necromatic, the head librarian. Eaglesoft apparently talks to himself. Captain Kid, Scorpio, and me. Okay, so he's like three people, I guess. Here we have another Lucas Films game. Oh, we're getting a review of the game now. We haven't even played it. And it holds true to the quality of their previous one thing. Who are they going to go to next for distribution? Oh. Sorry, folks. No Rush lyrics this time, so this guy likes to quote Rush. Later on. And then... Oh, oh, okay. Maniac Magic, here we are. So, you're scrambling trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. This music isn't bad. I could listen to this for a while, but I really wanted to play Maniac Mansion. Eventually, you figure out that you can just press space, and it'll start the game for you. And I mean, that eagle wasn't half bad for a Commodore 64. Um, so, that was the beginning. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, crackers, who only left your name in the high score table, but that was the beginning of this art scene right now. Uh, that and the ANSI art. And so, I'm, I'm going to give you another example. This is Duggar, which I have honestly never played, but I can't, I have to assume it's like Dig Dug or something. Um, and this was cracked by World of Wonder. Uh, this is for the Amiga, just to give you a little idea of, you know, what these look like just a little bit further into the timeline. And these are called, uh, you know, I mean, it's a little intro. It comes with the game. It's, it's a cracked game, so we call them Cracktros. Uh, so here is a Cracktro on the Amiga. Sorry, no disc loading noises. Didn't capture those. Dugger! A new game by Lionel Software, released by... Exclamation point. By who? <laughs> Gee, don't whip your dick around or hit anyone with it or anything. Wow, and cracked by Eurosoft. So World of Wonder didn't even crack the game, but they do really want to flaunt that. Oh, and here's their address, just in case you want to arrest them. West Germany, that'll put you in the era. You know, I, 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 wait, I need to stop this. I need to, this is, this is serious. West Germany. These these are nostalgic times, and you know, um, once upon a time, someone said we need to build a wall. But what we really need is just more crack trows. <laughs> for, for Tugger, apparently. All right, enough of that. Um, so, in Europe, copy discs looked a little bit more like this. Uh, you know, the, the one you copied from your friend, obviously you wanted to be, you know, instructional, make sure that your friend knew how to pirate Wolfenstein, um, you know, so that you can break the law together. Um, but in Europe, it's just a free-for-all. Everyone's just tagging discs and, like, graffitiing the disc and whatever. And not only that, but like taking the same disc, copying everything off of it, and then just throwing it right the fuck back in the envelope, and possibly trying to use the same stamps to send it back to someone else. <laughs> so, um, this is kind of cool though. You'll see some groups in here. Scoopex is uh, a popular demo group of the day. You know, you'll see everyone's, these are, by the way, these are punis, uh, you know, like discs, so shout outs to you know, a little just random Amiga sticker because, you know, like, 
someone really wanted to, you know, shout out signing, you know, like in the little, you know, like, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's, it was a, it, it's a different place at a different time. Uh, and this was just one of the many ways to get this, like, art out, right? You know, um, so eventually we would slip other things onto the disc. We didn't just slip that little something to, you know, have a crack intro or whatever. Uh, there were. Does anyone in here ever uh, do a zine in grade school? Let's, let's see some hands, come on. You don't have to be embarrassed, you're a hipster. Um, so, the computer nerd scene of zines is disc mags. And not only did we have disc mags, this is a Commodore 64 disc mag for Christ's sake. Um, this is the Sex and Crime number 14 issue. And if you go down here a little bit, you, I mean, we've got editorials, reactions, rumors, of course, uh, news, previews, mixed, but you go down here and charts. So people were actually still competing to not only have the best games that they cracked, not only to have the best cracks, but they were also competing to see who had the best crack intros. Everyone was trying to one-up each other with this little amount of space that was at the beginning of the disc that was left from them cracking the game. You know, like they cracked the game, you know, like 8K left on the disc, what are they gonna do? Well, some of the stuff that you just saw. Um, and so, you know, like everyone is like, oh, well, you know, I can make my logo bigger. I can make a star field with more stars. Uh, you know, I can shout out more demo groups. Uh, you know, I can say fuck more times, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, we had all of these disc mags, and, uh, you know, here's another one. Just to give you an idea of, like, I mean, look at this art. Like, some of this is, like, really cool. Uh, just, just kind of computer graffiti that you really just wouldn't see anywhere else, and there's still charts and that sort of a thing. Um, so this is obviously, you see this matching mouse cursor? I'm so proud of that. Um, I'm obviously using an Amiga mouse cursor, so this was an Amiga disc mag. And uh, here's another one. And so uh, eventually, you know, everyone's like kind of sharing their art and, you know, making more ANSI and ASCII art. Suddenly, we're, we're in the same era, right? Like in that, you know, crack tro that we saw, uh, it gave us the number of a BBS that we could call to download more software. And now we're seeing in disc mags, we're seeing, you know, some of this ASCII and ANSI art again. These scenes are one. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, like all of this stuff all converged in one, just people that want to just share information with each other, get it to each other, do it in an artistic way. Um, and people that wanted to click around in this stuff, sorry about that, uh, you know, you look through here and there's like this cool stuff and whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> What's the question you're not supposed to ask at Hope? Where's the party? So, inevitably, you, you don't want to ask the question, you just want to click on that, right? So, uh, you click on that, and by the way, I just want you to see, by the way, here's the boobies I warned you about. Um, uh, pretty, pretty good art. Uh, this is from Ra Razor1911. Uh, this is a, a fast forward. Shout outs to Razor. Um, this is in 1994. This is just a flip through. This person is just like hitting the right arrow key or clicking on the right arrow, going through this entire disc mag. Page third, there are 44 pages just in the news section. And you can see all of these people, right? And actually I should, I should rewind just a little. Here's Razor's news. You know, like you can see all of the people that joined Razor 1911 from the other group, Lemon, you know. Slash joined from silence, but was kicked out after only a week. <laughs> so a, a little bit of rumor action going on in here. Bokey was kicked out because he's a liar. He said that his demo was finished and forced our graphicians to work their asses off to finish it before the gathering 94. But he didn't show up, and after that we found out that he hadn't startly, hardly started on the demo. If you want to harass this loser, here's his fucking phone number. <laughs> Doxing and trolling alive in 1994. But uh, if we move through this a little, I was uh, also, eh, one more page, I think. 
here's Scoopex, the demo group that we saw, like, you know, tagged on the other disc. Like, this scene was just, you know, oh, and by the way, apparently they want you to know that Renegade and Nitman are not members of Scoopex. It's a common error. Don't. But, but look at this. This is like a magazine that, even if you read it at, like, relatively high speed, this is a 42-minute video. Like, it's going to take you a couple hours to get through this and, like, you know, uh, just read all of the gossip, and you've got all of these disc mags and all of that stuff. Um, so, eventually, uh, speaking of the Gathering '94, uh, let's let's rewind a little bit. I know I'm going back and forth, and maybe you're already feeling like you're traveling in time, so that's kind of jarring. I'm sorry about that. I'll give you some moon crystals later or whatever uh, for your time machine. Uh, this is a 40 kilobyte intro, so a few people were like, hey, um, what happens if maybe we have a little bit of extra space, like we don't have that 8K anymore or whatever, and we just want to do some like impressive stuff. We didn't crack this game, uh, but obviously we re received the system in the mail and we have to keep the piracy chain going. So we're just gonna throw a little something something on the disc and I uh, hope people like it, that's it. And so this happened. Prepare for a ray, ray traced animation. And you're like, okay, that's kind of cool. And they're like, oh, by the way. of animation, 16 colors, and this entire thing, the music and the graphics and everything are 40k. Some of this look like crap you've seen at a rave or something like that. Are we allowed to say rave in this day and age? I don't know. They outlawed it in Virginia. You have to call them dances now. It makes me feel like I'm doing a prom. Pretty cool though, I mean like, this is on, you know, an Amiga, running at like 7 megahertz, no 3D hardware, no real acceleration to speak of. If you want to contact us, here's our address. What's the point of cracking games? This is like really, imp ah, fuck, whatever. Uh, you saw it. What's the point of cracking games? That's like important because this is like the turning point of this whole scene. Like we don't care about cracking games anymore. We just want to make some cool art, do some impressive stuff with computers and move on with our lives. Or maybe not, maybe we'll be stuck doing this forever, which would be fine. Um, so, um, so now we're gonna go back to 1990. Um, and I want you to see this, which is one of the first, uh, well, maybe not the first, but like, uh, this, this isn't what we call an in vitro, which is basically an intro designed to invite you to something. Uh, and, you know, I mean, in the disc mags, you click on party and you learn where the party at. Well, these guys just decided to write their own entire binary that you would run and get invited. So let's see what they have to say. Amiga intro. Party time. I agree. Something great will be happening in Hamburg. TBS invites you to the biggest mega copy party. <laughs> Ever made in Hamburg, north of Germany, the whole world? Yes. And do you know why? We don't. <laughs> oh, something was forgotten. 
three stars hotel, 15 Amigas, about 30 disc drives, and we hope no police. <laughs> we hope you hope too. See, they knew that I was gonna be showing this at Hope, so they hope we hope. So if you, although wanna, come to enjoy the feeling of 15 Amigas, <laughs> contact us for more infos. Write to this address. Okay. Oh, we forgot the date of it. It is the 2nd of June, 1990. Or, 3rd of June, 1990. <laughs> or <laughs> both. <laughs> Credits go to, let's credit our artist, that's fine. Coding by Mr. Pet, with some help of Flow Soft. Music by Benny B, could be Benny Benassi, we don't know. Graphics by Voltron of the Possessed and Mr. Pet. Now the greetings. This time, only this time, they go to Possessed, Red Sector, Deathlock, PS1, Nox, COP, Cytex, Omex, Starman, Level 4, Abacus, Rata, Unit A, Digitech. AFL. I've only heard of like three of these people. But that's okay, at least I've heard of three. End. End. Okay then. And hopefully no police. Um, so, I don't have any pictures of Mega Copy Party 1990, unfortunately. Uh, and I don't know if anyone called the police, but I do have a picture of Party 1992, uh, which is still very much in the like seminal era of all of these demo parties kind of kicking off. So there are events, just like Hope or whatever fan conventions you go to, you know, sci fi, anime, games, whatever. Um, where everyone is not only bringing their machines to, you know, like get wares, obviously, uh, or, you know, participate in LAN parties or any of that, but also to show off cool hardware hacks. And not only to show off cool hardware hacks, but also to show off all of the cool demos and intros they've both accumulated and written if they're a part of a group. And so in a couple of these, you can see like signs for people like advertising the group that they're in and uh, that sort of a thing. And obviously you can see like weird European bottles of 7-Up. Um, and uh, you know, check out this like ghetto blaster, like stereo, whatever. It's pretty awesome. CRTs everywhere, of course. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's just basically like the equivalent of a, a, a hope mixed with a giant land party mixed with, you know, like an exhibition of all of these like cool demos that people have written. So at Party and a couple others, they actually invited you to bring your demos and win a cash prize for the best one that you have written because everyone for the past, you know, five or more years had been leapfrogging each other and trying to, you know, basically write, you know, have bigger logos than everyone else, have more stars on the screen move more pixels, do more impressive graphics, have better music. And so finally it was time for a face-off and party was a good example. So uh, what can you do at these demo parties? Well, uh, here are some modern demo parties and you can do food. Um, I actually, I know that one of these um, is from, actually, uh, well, this guy right in the corner is from Tokyo Demo Fest which is kind of cool, it's a demo party in Tokyo, obviously. Uh, but it's cool because you can see like the random ass Japanese, uh, like this is obviously normal, but then there's like some pizza with mayo and like katsu on it. <laughs> and uh, you know, some other stuff. And so some of the demo parties, you know, enjoy grilling. Some of them 
you know, book catering or whatever, but like there's usually some sort of like, uh, you know, sort of bonding over food that happens outside. Uh, there are obviously sleeping arrangements. I'm sure if you've been to Hope, this looks familiar. Um, you know, now, now we've finally upgraded to the hammocks. That was a nice addition. I actually made use of those. Um, but, you know, if you can't find a hammock, well, just get drunk and pass out on the stage. Um, so, uh, you know, now the large demo parties look like this shit right here. Is this amazing or what? Um, so here's a Vogue. This is a small party. And honestly, this reminds me right here a lot of the mezzanine area, even just a couple years ago. Uh, well, maybe more than a couple years ago when it was kind of a free-for-all and everyone was just doing stuff. I mean, it still is sort of a free-for-all, right? But, um, and here's Revision, which is actually much larger than this picture. This, this camera is forward in this. Uh, assembly, I guess, is still a little bit larger. Obviously, you can tell. Um, and Assembly has kind of taken on a land party aspect, whereas Revision is much more focused on uh, just demo exhibition and, that, and competition and that sort of a thing. Um, Evoke uh, is in uh, somewhere in Germany. I don't remember, I'm drawing a blank. Revision was in Saarbrücken uh, and Assembly is in Finland. Uh, if you have the ability to go to one of these, I highly recommend it. It is awesome. And they show demos on this nice big screen here with a reasonably sized PA. And you'll notice that we're in a room with a reasonably sized PA and a large screen. So after I finish yammering some, we're gonna watch a whole bunch of demos on a big screen with loud audio. Um, so are there some parties in the US? Yes, there are. Uh, I was just at at party in Boston. Uh, that was recent. And actually, are you in here? Some people that were at at party. What? Yeah. yeah. Oh, right over there. Jeez. Okay. Are you in this picture actually? No, I was way back. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, you were you were in the corner in this one, right? Uh, here's my laptop right here. This thing uh, has 512 LEDs on it. Not this one, but. Uh, TSA loves me. Um, and uh, shout outs to SceneSat, who runs the live streams at most of the demo parties. They're over here in this other picture. So here's Demo Splash, another one that happens in uh, October or November, usually November. Uh, this is in Pittsburgh. I actually have some flyers for Demo Splash since uh, it is scheduled for the 2nd and 3rd of November of this year. And I we, we really want to get more people to go. So if you want one of those flyers, hit me up after this is over, or, you know, like while we're screening or something. Um, and uh, this is at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon campus. Um, so shout outs to any uh, CMU kids. Uh, that party was held in Artisan's Asylum in the makerspace there in Boston. So that's kind of cool. There's another one that I don't have on this slide and that's called Synchrony. And that might be the one that's most interesting to you actually. Uh, you jump on a train here in New York City and you get on the train and you write your production and you work on your competition entry and whatever. You get off a train in Montreal and everyone shows their stuff. Kind of cool, huh? Um, most of these demo parties are a couple days long and that's how it goes. Um, so this is where shit gets real. Um, we've been watching... I agree. Um, we've been watching a whole lot of, this is my name, this is why I'm a badass, please call my BBS. Uh, by the way, the next effect is, you know, such and such technical detail that you really don't give a shit about. And, uh, yeah, enjoy. And then you just wait, and then you see the effect, and then they go to a screen again, and they're like, by the way, this next effect is such and such effect. Um, so, basically, in the middle to the end of 1993, uh, we started getting cinematic with our demos. Uh, we realized that, wait a minute, we just said that we hate cracking and we just want to do art, right? So why don't we just do art? Why don't we take up the whole floppy disk? And why don't we do something that's a good five, 10 minutes long and have it really rock some people's world? So if you're an Amiga kid, the first, and you know, this, this was shown at a party as well, um, this is Desert Dream by Kefrens, and this is running on a stock Amiga. So let's talk about the Amiga specs. I kind of touched on it just a minute ago. This is a 7.16 megahertz 68,000, 
Uh, shout outs to the 68,000 panel that was downstairs yesterday. Um, you know, this is that CPU, unaccelerated, uh, and the, the Amiga has a bunch of coprocessors that really help it out. Uh, so the sound chip can like play audio without the CPU necessarily needing to do a whole lot. That's really helpful, especially in what you're going to watch. Uh, there is no 3D acceleration unless you use a mode called hold and modify. You can only do really 32 colors on the screen at a time. Uh, but some people do like to use the hold and modify mode, and of course there are hacks. Um, so this machine comes stock with 512K of RAM. You can upgrade it to a meg. A lot of people did. Uh, and uh, let's, let's just let's let's start watching. Let's see what an Amiga can do. This is about 10 minutes long. Um, I might pause in a couple places, but I, I really kind of want to want you to just experience this on a whole as as people did. So I'm I'm going to do my best not to break in and talk. Oops. Let me get the play button. It's supposed to. Yes, that is a watermelon. Chew that shit at me.
Here we get some uh, quick scene poetry. At last, we need to hold his eyes so he can no more terrorize. He wanted us to blame the melon, but now he felt us turn the hell on. The alien is now so dead. Whoops, I don't read fast enough. This machine is 7 megahertz, has no 3D capabilities. Yeah. Thank you.
not a real demo unless there's a spinning cube. This is what dick pics looked like in Should work on any A500, 600, 2000, A3000, even proved to work on a 4000. Took a half a year. Thanks go out to a bunch of people. This is gonna be the last demo that they're gonna write that will be compatible with non AGA. They decided to buy an Amiga 1200. Dreams can't come true. demo and this was on you know I mean a pretty ancient computer all things considered uh, and you know I mean this is 1993 so what were you doing 1993 like we, we, we were barely we were about to get doom you know we got yeah, playing King's Quest playing 2d games you know like this was kind of an introduction of 3d for us we didn't even have 3D hardware. We had like Wolfenstein and we were blown away by that, but like to see all these cool effects and to see this like rock and music, all of that happening at once was just, you know, like people were floored. People were grabbing this off of BBSs, showing it in computer stores. Shareware companies had actually like gone and tried to sell the demos. And some of the demos even start up with a notice that says, this demo is not to be sold for money. You know, just because people were actually selling the demos because they were, people thought they were so cool that they could make money off of the demos. Um, you know, just like this, this was just a new world, right? So, I don't know why I'm out of full screen. Um, so, 
There was this other demo group, uh, and they were pretty little, and they were pretty unknown. Uh, they had done a couple things on the Commodore 64 and published a little bit of art. Uh, they were obsessed with swords and medieval stuff. And uh, what that is like, a, I guess it's a, a dragon. It kind of, at first I thought it was a slime monster. But, uh, but then they decided that they were going to leave the Commodore 64 scene, get some new members, and join the PC world. And uh, in 1993, at almost the exact same time as Desert Dream, they decided to put this out. All right, before I show this, can I get a show of hands of people that saw Desert Dream before I showed it? All right, but how many people in this room have seen Second Reality already? Just to give you an idea of how famous this demo is, this is like the de facto demo that people go to when they're talking about you know, how cin cinematic and how impressive and that sort of thing. This is probably running on like a 486.33 or something like that, just to give you an idea of this machine. Uh, yeah, he's a local bus. <laughs> Actually, uh, it's funny you mentioned that. I, uh, I used to work at a computer store, and long after like Visa Local Bus was dead, uh, we, we really got excited when computers came in that had Visa Local Bus. And one of my coworkers was always like, this is Visa Local Bus! <laughs> and he's like a volunteer fireman from the military and like worked at Exide Battery Company. And like, I, was no, I had no clue why he was so excited for a Visa local bus, but he was totally excited for it, and that just made my day. So uh, let's watch Second Reality by the Future Crew, uh, and maybe I want you to notice how many diff how many uh, similarities Second Reality has to Desert Dream, which you just saw. So, oops. <laughs> Spoilers. last like five minutes of this are all credits. We're not going to go through all of the credits, but I do want you to see the demo and you know, the initial credits. So we've got an intro, Assembly 93, so that gives you an idea of how long that party's been going.
start. There's a sword.
biased towards the right channel. I feel like the left channel is a little bit not loud. But you should be able to hear that beep, 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 beep. Thank you. Assembly 94, that's important. Wasn't there a version of the executable that lets you start it and jump it at any point, particularly in that demo? Um, I think you could specify as like a command line like option or set, something yeah. like that, like second.exe5. Right. You know, right. A lot of demos would do stuff yeah. like that. Um, there are a lot of demos where um, uh, for a while, uh, you know, you could like both buttons were required, like mouse buttons on Amiga demos should exit. But the right, right mouse button should, uh, or left mouse button should skip oh. uh, through demos. So if you're watching demos on the Amiga, you can usually skip with like one key or one button. Escape key or uh, the left mouse button. Right? Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Depends on the demo. Uh, so does anyone want to like just sit here and watch this cat for a couple minutes? <laughs> um, so, so this is important actually in a way because demos uh, are basically the earliest not really. Uh, form of computer memes. Uh, we do see a lot of things repeating in the demos. You might have noticed between Desert Dream and uh, Second Reality that there were a lot of parts that were similar. Does anyone want to shout out what they saw? That dots, they saw? dots. Lots of dots, okay. Spaceships, polygons. Spaceships, polygons. Samples. Samples, yeah. Samples. Missiles. Missiles, okay, yeah. Plasma. Plasma, good. Someone knows that. Excellent. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to roll through some of my favorite demo effects and shout out some demos. Uh, there are some screenshots and some demos in here. And then uh, whatever time is left over after we go through all of these, but there are some great examples in here and some, uh, some of my favorite demos and some, some very important examples in my opinion. All right, let's stop looking at the cat. Um, I'm getting it like three times because I get lights behind me and this <laughs> and that. Um, so uh, something, that, that I would say the, the most important thing of any demo is scroll text. Not, not really, maybe important is the wrong word, most prevalent effect. Um, and you'll see people try all sorts of crazy shit and uh, you know, my description of this is, you know, drunk or sleep-deprived team member at the keyboard, what's up? Uh, because a lot of these demos were basically almost done by the time they got to the, you know, the party hall or whatever, but they wanted to, you know, like, 
finish it off or fix a little piece at the end or that sort of a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, so you get like someone that's just like, hi, this is Felix, it's 3 a.m. and Jack hasn't fixed the scroll text yet, but I'm typing it anyway. Um, and it, you get all sorts of stuff like that. Um, you also get pixel and scene art. I thought this was uh, some, some interesting examples of scene art here. Uh, so uh, I just, I picked this because I just thought it was hilarious, but um, this is a great, this is an intro screen from a demo that we, I think I have and we can watch, uh, but just, you know, an awesome looking logo from Sensor uh, and Oxyron, which is kind of off the edge here or whatever. Uh, this is neat because it shows off uh, an issue and a limitation that you run into on some machines. Most notably, this is the X Spectrum where you have an attribute issue. Uh, each section of the screen can only be two colors, a foreground and a background color. So you draw with the foreground color and then everything else is the background color. But you can only do that in various chunks of the screen, so you have to very artistically choose which areas of the screen get which colors and get which pieces of the image possibly even reposition your image so that the parts of the image are in the right place on the screen. It takes a lot of work. Um, so you get also, anyway, you get all sorts of computer graffiti, bang and logos, you know, astronauts. Um, also a big part you may have noticed was greets. Uh, these are often done in a kind of cool artistic way too. Uh, this is really the gangster rap shout outs of the computer scene. Uh, you know, over here we have a robot shooting the names of the, the people greeted. Uh, in here we're kind of in a fly-through in a city, but you see all the names of groups. This demo over here is by Titan, but here's a, a demo by the group Mercury, and they are greeting Titan on a signboard. And then over here we have another demo, and you can see Titan is group greeted, and so is Mercury. So, like, this is a community of groups that, at this point, you know, aren't trying to like be assholes to each other. They're really just trying to like be a part of this sort of like party, uh, party, party scene or something like that. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, shout outs to the people that shouted out doubts because, you know, the dots. <laughs> Get excited about dots. <laughs> Round of applause for dots. Also, you can have some of that applause, dude, who likes dots. Um, we had someone who said plasma. I didn't have to explain, you know, what plasma was. That's kind of cool. But just in case you didn't know what plasma is, it's this kind of cool plasma, you know, flowy, pretty, whatever it is, effect. So 3D on non-3D hardware. This is kind of important, right? Uh, so here we have a DOS demo. This is actually one of the first demos I ever saw in DOS. Uh, I ran this on a 286, uh, and it seemed to work okay, and we, it just rolls through all sorts of, like, vectors and stuff, and, you know, I mean, we just had, like, a VGA card, like, not even Super VGA, with, like, 256K or 512K of RAM on the card, uh, and we're able to do 3D, because why not? Uh, also, you can do 3D on an Atari, believe it or don't. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time uh, playing My Spinning Cube is Better Than Your Spinning Cube, which was one of the alternate names for this panel, but I thought that you know, the other panel titles. So there's those. We saw a lot of tunnels, and for these, I actually have some examples. Um, so uh, here's one where the entire demo is just is a tunnel.
Shoutouts to everyone that started the glow stick rave in the back. I highly approve.
volumes to the light switch rave. We've reached the halfway point. You can rave out to more demos. There are more. It's a lot more of the same, so I want to I wanna make sure that we get through everything. Because, really, we could just be watching demos all night, but... <laughs> all right. Also, some pretty awesome looking ray tracing, ray marching happens in demos. Is that real water? We don't know. Also, uh, while we were watching the demo, we got a, a shout out from uh, someone who's watching the stream in San Francisco. So, shouts back. Everyone clap for everyone that's watching the live stream. Actually, uh, if anyone doesn't want to be in a photo, would you duck, please? I would like to take a photo of the audience, but I'd like to also respect uh, people that don't want to be in it. <laughs> All right, some of that will go out on social media. Be sure to tag yourself if it ends up somewhere where you can do that. Um, All right, some other stuff. So um, has anyone ever heard the term uh, size queen? Well, um, this, this is the opposite of that, um, for better or worse. I don't know if that came out right. Anyway, um, these are people that are obsessed with getting their program code to be as small as possible. Um, the funny thing is, is that both of these demos I'm about to show you are actually also on limited hardware, but a lot of people are obsessed, like, I mean, in modern machines, we don't have limitations for CPU. We don't have limitations for, for RAM. We have gobs of just everything that we want. So people artificially limit themselves to something like insanely small so that they can compete against each other in another category. But just to give you an idea of how small these are, these are both 256 bytes in size. Um, so first I'm gonna show you something by LFT. Um, this guy, I'm actually sort of, I don't know how to put this, there's, there's a group of people on IRC um, called 3LN, which stands for three letter nicknames because LFT is 3LN, and I'm also in 3LN because my IRC nickname is three letters long. So, um, this is by, uh, actually if you saw the video that made its rounds called the Chipophone, where the guy had like repurposed an old organ into like a MIDI instrument and then linked it to chiptune stuff. This is the same guy. Um, and he decided to write a Commodore 64 thing. And so imagine with like 256 bytes, uh, even if you don't know anything about coding, you know that you really can't do a lot with 256 bytes. Uh, and if you do know a lot about coding, you're wondering even more what this guy did with 256 <laughs> bytes. Uh, but you know that everything is going to have to be procedural to, you know, like almost the maximum extent and that there won't be, you won't be able to do any switch ups, you won't be able to do anything like, you know, original, it's just going to have to be a thing that kind of loops and does a thing. So I chose both of these because they both kind of break or go beyond that barrier. Uh, a Mind is Born has a progression switch up halfway or like two thirds of the way through and uh, immediate railway as well, you'll see in a minute. Um, so let's watch Mind is Born.
256 bytes. You can fit that in a tweet. <laughs> if you don't know what a byte is. Does anyone here not know what a byte is? Okay, good, I don't have to make fun of it. <laughs> All right, this is cool uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, obviously, the demo is cool. This is a DOS demo. Uh, probably runs on like, I don't know, a mid of, middle of the road Pentium 1 or something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what their exact like compo machine was. Uh, but this is also a live version of the demo and there's a couple reasons I picked the live version. One is because I want to kind of give you, you know, the, uh, the feeling that you were there and, you know, experience it as it was experienced the first time. I think that's really cool and important. But also, uh, I want you to listen to a room full of nerds <laughs> cheering because someone wrote something in 256 bytes that is amazing. Um, this, it's, it's really important to see how supportive, like, this scene is of its people, and you know, like it's it's kind of it's not necessarily a small scene, but it's still kind of underground, right? Like there were uh, like half of this room was not completely aware of the demo scene before we started, and now you're getting an education, you know. But uh, these 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 guys are so cool, and it's just it's really so great to see everyone supporting each other like this. So um, anyway, here we go. Let's let's watch. A few drunk people in the audience too. Railroad tracks, but wait. There's a tunnel. But wait. This was the time when Bosnian the first scene this afternoon that we said if it is easy, fucking impossible. <laughs> so give it for us, please! Thank you very much. That's the end of that comment. So, if you look at this, you'll see that that was entry number 11 in a single party's contributions to a 256 byte intro. Just to give you an idea, and this is function, like, I mean, function was big-ish, but like, it's no, by no means, you know, like, uh, an assembly or whatever, and they still managed to get that many entries, so that was cool. So, the thing that was important, and I just kind of let you watch and didn't say it, is, it's really hard to generate original data uh, and a whole bunch of it that changes a lot in something that small. So everyone usually gravitates towards the procedural thing or you know, some sort of algorithm that can modify itself or something like that. Well, drawing those tracks, sure, that was an algorithm and you can loop it and that sort of thing. But like then being able to come up with the tunnel and then being able to come up with the train. And by the way, I've never heard a room full of people like lose their shit for a train, so that's really cool. Um, you know, so uh, this is just an example of some of the size coding that you see in the scene. And I mean, people now have, you know, 256 byte intros for DOS with sound and like amazing stuff. It's just, it's pretty great. Uh, so sometimes you get references to the party you're at. Uh, and you know, like, People like literally destroy the building that the dem uh, like the demo party is in or whatever, um, and uh, you know other times they're just you know like obviously this is a Commodore 64 demo of a Commodore 64 demo with people with their cell phones in the air taking pictures, <laughs> uh, um, you know, and party in jokes and that sort of a thing. And that's pretty great. You know, hardware references, um, so in Intel outside. Probably a handful of people have at least seen, you know, Intel outside or, you know, uh, the, this, the, I actually kind of forgot to mention, and I should have mentioned, uh, that really those demos in 1993 kicked off a semi-huge, does anyone know about the Mac versus PC war? I, 
bad news for you. There was no Mac versus PC war. It was Mac versus, or it was PC versus Amiga. Yep. <laughs> um, and you know, like especially at demo parties, it was huge. Everyone, uh, like the PC scene, was kind of like always trying to one up something that the Amiga had done. And then the Amiga guys were like, guess what? We've got coprocessors. Um, and, uh, and it just kept going back and forth. And let's see your PC do this. And let's see your Amiga do that. And you know, the Atari guys were like, guys, guys. <laughs> you know, but, uh, um, but so you see a lot of people just mocking the other people's hardware. Even these days, you see a lot of hardware mocking. But now we're all just kind of doing it in good fun because I think most of us well, maybe like 80% of us have realized that we're now in the future and we don't use these machines for anything anymore other than this. Um, so I want to give you an example of a machine that, or a demo that specifically uh, compares uh, PC to Amiga, or not PC to Amiga, PC to Commodore 64, I'm sorry. So uh, this is a demo on a PC with a CGA card. Anyone ever have a CGA card? Yeah. Yeah. How many colors do you get in CGA? Four or 16. Four or 16 in text mode. Uh, so this is a demo that uses CGA. It's an original PC. It's a 5150. has 640K of RAM. So it's expanded in that manner, I suppose, right? But like no other expansions. It's just a stock machine. This is on a floppy disk or it could be. Um, and uh, they compare themselves to the Commodore 64 scene because, you know, it's only 4.77 megahertz. And it's, you know, it's, it's on the machine that defines the x86 architecture, more or less. So let's, let's give it a look. I just spoiled the whole goddamn thing. <laughs> let's try that again. So 64, let's, let's point out a couple of these things that they're talking about. Obviously, the, the PC is no comparison in the sound department. Uh, this character set thing, uh, on, on a Commodore 64, you can make an A look like a stylized A in the font, in memory, and it will update all of the A's on the screen or that sort of thing. You can't do that in CGA. Uh, everyone probably knows what a sprite is, but you have a hardware mechanism where you can define some graphics and move them around the screen and you don't actually have to like write them to video RAM, like the video hardware automatically does that. So you can move your character around or you know, bullets around or whatever, or enemies, that sort of thing. You don't have those in CGA. Uh, raster interrupts where you can, in, you can interrupt the video or you can fire off and interrupt while you're drawing video to do other things. Well, you can't do that on CGA. Many video pages, so you could draw, uh, has anyone heard of double buffering? Yep. So, uh, you can do that on Commodore, but you can't do that on CGA. Uh, you could, the, the idea of double buffering, for anyone that doesn't understand, is basically you could draw an image in the background on another video page, and then you could be like, switch to this page, and just everything would appear. And basically, you wouldn't, like, the user wouldn't see you drawing your graphics, that sort of thing. So, we've, we've learned that, you know, like, we're on a PC, but maybe the PC isn't so good after all, right? Well, I have some new information. We're still on CGA.
demo scene poetry here. processor in the Amiga, VIC-2 is the video chip in the Commodore 64, and obviously they made a cool rhyme with it. So far not bad for 4 megahertz, huh?
anyone that was stuck with CGA in their childhood just kind of had it shattered a little bit. Because we knew that our graphics cards could do more all along. And finally we've seen it happen. By the way, now you're listening to a mod playing on the PC speaker on an XT. Of course, everyone has to get their greets and shouts out. All right, so we end up through these credits. I'm sorry to the whole team for skipping your, your greets. So, here is another era. You know what's about to happen. More dancing. Where are my glow stick peeps at? Oh no, we might have lost our glow stick peeps. Well, that's all right. We're gonna just have to start another glow stick rave. So this is for the Amiga by a group called Spaceballs. No relation. And this fits on a single floppy.
not bad. And that was an unexpanded Amiga, by the way. So we're still, that's back to 7.1 megahertz land. Uh, so a whole bunch of stuff happened in between that and the next demo I'm about to show you. But I want to show you where we ended up and a demo that honestly, when I saw it, I can't prove it because I don't know. But I feel like was maybe very heavily inspired uh, by the demo we just watched. This is Ziphead by CNCD and Fairlight. Uh, Fairlight has been cracking games on the 64 since the beginning of time. Still around. Uh, yeah, they're still, I mean, this, this demo is proof that they're still around, right? Um, and uh, this is on a modern PC. There are no limitations. They did not even size limit themselves. But I believe what they wanted to do with this demo was try to bring the competition machine to its knees. Uh, they did not succeed, actually. So they ended up with something truly impressive. And I, this is a couple years old at this point. Uh, so you'll see what you can do on, you know, reasonably modern hardware, but same idea.
So, I think everyone in this room can agree no cracking was involved in the production of that demo, and yet some serious work went into that. Uh, and if anyone hasn't caught on yet, all of this is algorithmically generated. These, I mean, obviously I'm playing you videos now, but these are videos of captures of real hardware doing real math to draw everything that you see on the screen. Uh, it's actually sort of an unspoken, well, no, I think it's probably been written in some rule books or whatever, but you're not allowed to use animations or movies in your demos unless there's a fancy compression technique or some sort of technical feat that you're doing, like com compressing an entire like three minute video onto a floppy disk or something like that. Uh, so all of this stuff has to be mathematically run on hardware. So the CPU, and in this case, there was a GPU involved, are all doing real work. Um, so uh, anyone want to watch some more? Yeah. So, uh, we just, uh, you, might, you might see some familiar things in here, um, but uh, some, some, some weird guy thought it would be funny if he recreated the demo that you just watched on an Atari 2600. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is it's actually good. Um, so I want to talk to you about the specifications of the Atari 2600 real fast. It's a pile of shit. <laughs> there, I'm done. No, um, the Atari 2600, first and foremost, uh, who in here knows how to get video out to a monitor using something relatively new on a computer? I should see more hands in that. The video card has memory, and if you put a picture in that memory, then the video card will automatically, you know, 60 times a second or whatever, take that image that is in memory and poop it out to the screen. So, the Atari 2600 does not have this memory. <laughs> so what you're doing to draw images on the screen with an Atari 2600 is firing interrupts and telling the, the, the Atari that at this point, this point, this point, and this point, on the next line that you draw across the TV, you're gonna to change to this color, this color, this color, and this color. There are no interrupts on the 2600. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. There are no lots of things on the 2600. <laughs> the amount of memory, does anyone know how much memory the Atari 2600 has? 128 bytes. There it is. Less than a text message worth of memory. And the CPU is like one megahertz, or 1.09, or 1.07. Yeah. Well, the CPU is 1.79, but on the 2600, you have a 6507 that runs at 1.0. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, knowing all of these things, uh, especially the part where the 2600 is really quite the pile of shit, uh, do you think that it would be able to do anything even remotely resembling what we just watched? Let's find out. Oh, and the sound chip can do two sounds at a time, that's it.
his own. Not a bad piece of work. So also in my covers section here, I have Desert Dream, which we watched, and Second Reality, which we watched, except this time they are on the one megahertz Commodore 64, which is conveniently one seventh or one thirty third the speed of either of the machines they were written for. Which one do we want to watch first? How about, how about we do room cheer type stuff? Make some noise for Desert Dream. Make some noise for Second Reality. All right, Second Reality wins it. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> Grab us ultrasound in my Commodore 64, hell yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, hey.
decided not to say anything.
obviously they go through and do exactly the same thing as the other demo for the credits. So uh, I want to skip forward so that you can watch this demo, which has a screenshot that looks like the beginning of what I showed you earlier. This is running on a modern machine. This is from the beginning of this decade. So it's spoiled right there. That entire thing, all of the audio, all of the video, all of the code, four kilobytes. It's modern hardware, but can you do that with four kilobytes? I see some arms in the air. Oh, that's for me. I was gonna say, if you can write that in four kilobytes, I wanna watch. Um, so, really, I mean, I'm just, uh, like, you just sit there and you think, like, okay, 4K, how could you even just get the music into 4K? They don't even have room for samples. They sound like samples. They're not samples. It's a synthesizer built in, generating all of the audio in real time, and then they're generating the terrain in real time and syn synchronizing everything in real time. It's kind of awesome. Uh, so, I want to show you something that came out this year uh, and was shown in the competition at Revision, 
Uh, and the first time I watched it, I was like, wait a minute, is this elevated? Also, uh, can we get some applause for the, the Hope staff because they just extended this by 30 minutes so we can yeah. watch some more demos. days and everyone's watching this and they're like uh wait a minute is this a remix a remix of elevated guesses is how big that was? 8K. 0K. <laughs> you said 8K. You're right. 8 kilobytes for the whole thing. No way. Yes way. Yeah. It was all the snowman. Um, all right. So there's also a lot of fourth wall breaking um, and these are very important in my opinion because basically it's the demo coder finally communicating with his audience. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm a chip musician, right? So I want to communicate with my audience by writing a tune that like really resonates with someone or they can like listen to the tune and kind of start to feel what I was feeling while I was writing it or, you know, like, and, and if I can convey my message through music, that's really important. Uh, but this is just a little bit more blatant, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. Uh, this is shout-outs to Phoenix. 
uh, who hung out with me at that party actually and wrote parts of this uh, demo with some other team members. This is written in Quick Basic. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone that remembers Nibbles and Gorilla. Gorilla. <laughs> All right. Here's here's your DOS love, DOS love letter from the demo scene. YouTube up and ask him about this error that I keep. There's a little bit of that 
Uh, I want to show you another demo from Revision this year. There's a, uh, a group called Space Pigs, and uh, they're known for putting out some slightly esoteric stuff. Um, you might say they are the CDC of the demo scene in a way. Um, yeah, that wasn't meant as a dig, by the way. Uh, so they, they put out a demo a couple years ago, and it was very misunderstood. Um, and they got a lot of negative, there's a, uh, there's a website called Poet, or Poe, or you know, however you want to pronounce it. And uh, this is where all of us converge and vote on demos and talk to each other, and there's some forums, and people can vote up, vote down, or you know, assign a pig to the demo. Uh, so these guys got a lot of negative feedback on their demo, no one really got it. Um, so they decided to, you know, get serious and bring their A-game to Revision, which is definitely a good place to bring your A-game. Uh, tons of the productions at Revision are just so good. Uh, so here's what they brought. demos that we watched before and how there was like a screen that showed the name of the demo and who wrote it and which entry number that was and that sort of a thing. All, all of these demos when they're shown live have kind of, the, the, the demo parties usually do that at almost all of the demo parties. So they also do that at Revision, just something to keep in the back of your head. This is in the demo. <laughs> so they accidentally are trolling the entire audience with the demos over, except all of these are the, uh, the, the little transition screens from the previous demo party at Revision. <laughs> except for the fact that this demo right here that they're, they're saying that they're about to show, which by the way is almost 500K, and the platform is PC, Amiga 060, Amiga 320, Nintendo DS, and Atari VCS. How they got a 
demo production to run on all of that hardware at once is interesting. We started like four hours before the deadline. Now we totally wasted. Keep up the good spirit. We love seeing. Um, so um, the thing is, is when they show you this, this demo. Um, the demo that you just saw was shown earlier in the competition that this demo was entered in. What? Like, like literally an hour before this demo was shown in the, in the same compo, you just saw that except less, less glitchy. And so everyone by now is going, what the hell is going on? And also, we're wondering how you can get a, sex, a 17 megabyte demo on a Pico 8 with Mac OS 9 for Windows. But shout outs to Farbrash, they're a really great demo group. So, we also saw this demo. 45 minutes prior to this demo. Except someone, someone turned 40. Now they've turned 37. And uh, this translates roughly, well, the other demo translates to this person is old, it's their birthday. I don't know what hare is instead of yare, but I think it has something to do with Harry. And the reason I think that is because of this. So, we've successfully, or accidentally... I'm, so now we have to watch a 1.5 terabyte demo on the Atari SDE, Tandy, PC Junior, and PDP-1. I don't know why you need both of these machines. They're almost pretty much the same machine. If you truly love something, let it fly. I hope you're all ears. Cute. <laughs> nice little <load of> screen. <laughs> oh. Oh, man, <laughs> uh, demo for 386 protected mode 204k
So, breaking the fourth wall is possible, just in case you didn't know. Also, here's another meme inside of demos, twisters. I actually uh, don't have any of these as demos, but you can see what's going on here. And this is an empty slide. So I have some time for a bonus demo or two. Uh, I want to show you two demos for the Sega Mega Drive, otherwise known as the Genesis here in North America. One has a shout out to uh, anyone that loves the 68,000, but also uh, I mentioned that I was going to show some console-based stuff. And most of what we've seen so far is, uh, with the exception of the 2600, is computer-based stuff. Don't call it 2600. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, it is we can it call it whatever we want, uh, but... Do you have anything about Rage of 1911? Uh, I probably do. Uh, I have a whole ton of stuff. Uh, I really want to show these, uh, these overdrive demos, though. Um, oops. It's just... So this is an unexpanded Sega Genesis. You can see this is by Titan, and it came out in Evoke. Self-deprecating, I guess.
All right, I'm running short on time. So we're gonna go balls to the wall for this last one. I would like to show you, I, if you remember I said there's no motion video in demos unless there's a cool compression technique. So I'd like to show you a cool compression technique where someone doesn't only get sampled audio coming out of Commodore 64, but full motion video synchronized to it. Um, and this is just, again, like all of this stuff is like mind blowing. On a one megahertz Commodore 64. Maybe I can convince some of you coders out there to write some of these. Or at least quit programming in languages that start with J. Anyone want to guess at the file size of this? Not, not 4K. <laughs> this fits on a one meg Commodore 64 cartridge. Video, audio, everything. So I, uh, my phone says 231, my laptop says 225. Are we like right at the end? Uh, strike a balance. Strike a balance. Time for one more. <laughs> See what we got in here. 
man, wants like tons of crap. Just kidding, these are like some of the best things ever. I do have a Wonderland, I think. Uh, I don't have Wonderland, and I probably don't have Coma Land either. Um, oh, well, you know, earlier we did not watch The Desert Dream on the Commodore 64 version. You want to end with that for the night? Or should we go for... Hold on. I don't see any Apple II demos in there. <laughs> yeah, I thought I had my Apple II. Oh, there's a TGS demo. What about the Trash 80? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there are some Coco demos that are pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately is probably the right answer to that. Uh, so we could watch, De uh, actually, uh, if you don't want to watch Desert Dream again, uh, we could watch Overdrive 2. You want to do that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay with me. go.
So hey, I want to thank you all for coming and sitting here with me and uh, hanging out. Uh, I have some cards and uh, some demo flyers and stuff you can grab from me if you want to learn more about the scene or more about chiptunes or whatever. Uh, we are the last thing in this room tonight, uh, so they're going to lock the doors after you get out of here. If you can please pick up a piece of trash on the way out or something and help clean things up, uh, that would be awesome and it would keep the hotel and the staff happy. So. Yeah, please pick up your trash. Inverse phase! Yeah. Do we want to make this a regular thing at Hope from now on? Yeah. All right. Thank you.